Hello, and welcome to Education Now. I'm Josephine Kim, Senior Lecturer on Education at the Harvard Graduate School of Education. And today we're going to discuss strategies that educators and schools and district leaders can use to successfully partner with their students' families. It's all with the goal of improving young people's learning and development. We want to engage the audience in this conversation, so please submit your questions for our panelists by using the Q&A button at the bottom of the Zoom screen. You'll also find closed captioning there. So let's start by welcoming our guests. We have Eyal Bergman. He's Senior Vice President of Learning Heroes, a nonprofit that conducts research about the impact of family engagement and school outcomes. The organization also trains schools and district leaders to, to build more effective family engagement systems. We also have Shade Harris, President and CEO of Groundwork Consulting. Shade is also an assistant professor and special assistant to the Dean, on, Dean of Education at Virginia State University. And we have one of our very own, Karen Mapp, Professor of Practice at the Harvard Graduate School of Education. It's so great to have you all here. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Karen, great to have you. Karen, let's start with you. I remember hearing from families during the COVID-19 pandemic that engaging with schools almost felt optional and maybe even like a luxury. You've done extensive research on effective family engagement over the years. And what would you say is the most important aspect of this work? So thank you so much for having me. I'm really excited to be here today. So since we have limited time, I'm really going to focus on um, a, a sort of a big headline, a big story out of the research that I've done over the past 30 or so years on family engagement, and specifically something we found when a group of us, including my good friend and colleague, Ann Henderson, published our latest book, Everyone Wins. And it's actually the fifth uh, in the evidence series about the impact of engagement. And, you know, one of my colleagues and some of you may remember and know Susan Moore Johnson, she used to always say to me, make sure that you talk about the big headlines out of the research. And one of the big headlines out of our review of the research was that relationships matter. And so the intentional cultivation of something called relational trust, which is a term that was coined by uh, Tony Bright and Barbara Schneider in their fabulous book, Trust in Schools, that relational trust is really essential to the building of partnerships and engagement and engagement that really is in the service of the success of our schools and our students. In fact, they have a wonderful quote in the book, which says that relational trust sustains an ethical imperative among organizational members mm. to advance the best interests of children. In this regard, relational trust constitutes a moral resource for school improvement. That's a pretty powerful statement. And so what I have found, not only in my own research, but in the research that we've seen over the past 50 plus years, is that when we look at best practice in family engagement, that the relational piece is key. And in fact, what I did in a framework that I published uh, called the Dual Capacity Building Framework, which is designed to help organizations plan and strategize for their family engagement. The relational piece really moves at the top of what we call are the essential conditions for best practice and engagement. So I would say that the big news and the big headline, and one that we've known about for a while, but for reasons that would probably take a lot longer than this webinar, we have a tendency to not follow through on, relationships really matter. You have to be intentional about creating relationships of trust and respect. And that's especially the case after the pandemic. Thank you, Karen, for that. Now, I wanna name something a little bit uncomfortable, but we know that some families, caregivers, and communities, they've actually felt alienated or even ignored by some of their children's schools. Um, so what do educators and districts need to do differently to build up this trust that you're talking about with families? families who are both established, well-established in the communities, but also those that are just now arriving into the communities. You know, Joe, it's it's interesting, you know, even though we've double clicked on the importance of developing trust, I think what I've seen over the years in my work with districts and schools and ministries of education is that somehow or another, people think that this trust just happens, that it just it just falls out of the sky. 
and that they don't need to be intentional about cultivating these trusts. So in my work that I've done with schools, in fact, work that I did with a school here in Boston years ago, the O'Hearn School, what I saw is they were very intentional about developing relationships, particularly with new families, families who had felt disenfranchised by the school systems, in some cases for generations. And what they did was something I called the joining process, where they very intentionally welcomed families into the community. And that was done in many ways, including meeting the families where they were at instead of always expecting them to come to the school. They honored families' voices. They treated families as experts on their children. They would say things like, you are the, your child's first teacher. Could you please tell me what you know about your child so I can be the very best teacher I can possibly be with your knowledge helping me? And then what they did was they actually made sure that they continuously connected families to their children's learning. So a lot of times we do what my friend um, Kate Crow Cressley coins random acts of family engagement, where we're not really connecting families to what kids should know and be able to do. So through the joining process, they very intentionally built that relational trust with their families. It just doesn't happen uh, you know, just because. It happens because you really are intentional about cultivating it. So I would say that sometimes I see that places, districts and schools skip over the step, they go right to the programming and they they don't acknowledge that, you know, I think Sade is gonna talk about this, that harm has been done in many cases in these communities. And so we have to really be intentional about reaching out, letting families know we care, letting families know that they are important to us. Because if we don't do that, they may assume, and rightly so in many cases, that they are not heard and they're not gonna be respected. Mm -hmm. I really love this idea of joining. Um, it really sounds like we're wanting to use the families, their cultures and the things that they're bringing as really the foundations of learning for our students. So it's a nice segue, Shade. Um, I know you've had a lot of personal experience with this work on the grounds. You were the first chief engagement officer for Richmond Public Schools in Virginia. How did you build up this trust with families in your community so that they genuinely felt like they were valued by the school? Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. Um, the first thing when I think of, when I think about the work um, in Richmond as well as other places that we had to do is honor history. Um, Dr. Sarah Lawrence Lightfoot has this beautiful quote where she says, "Families do not walk into schools or walk through those school doors as individuals, but rather representatives of their families, of their histories, and their aspirations woven through the tapestry of their children's lives. So recognizing that you are not coming in as an individual, but you're bringing that history, um, those experiences, and for so many of our families, a lot of those experiences have been experiences where they haven't felt valued, where they haven't felt seen or appreciated. And with so much going on, right? Raising your kids, providing for your kids, families will not go places that don't value them. So the first mm -hmm. thing we had to start is understanding. And they say the first step in healing is truth. We had to tell ourselves the truth and say that, you know, there has been some harm that has been done. We didn't have to fix everything, but we had to acknowledge it. So just acknowledging that as the first step and honoring that history from a very strength-based perspective. I worked in Richmond, you know, home of Jack and Jackson Ward, one of the most thriving, you know, Black communities. They used to call it Harlem of the South. I didn't know any of this before I came to Richmond. I'm from Massachusetts, right? But being intentional about knowing the strengths of the community, but also the harm that had been done. And then starting there, we were then able to kind of build on that and then define what does engagement mean for us? And for us, it was about building relationships, sharing power, affirming differences, you know, promoting advocacy. And most importantly, it was linked to learning. So Dr. Mapp said those kind of like one-off engagements, we had to say, no, we're looking for sustained engagement that is linked to learning. I oh, appreciate that. I mean, there's something really beautiful about acknowledging history because it really makes you feel seen 
And again, going back to that value, right? Um, today at Richmond Public Schools, you also ran a campaign. This is so interesting to me. You called it We Love You Here. Can you tell us a little bit more about that and the steps that you took to show that families were a genuine priority in that district? Absolutely. I still remember um, the moment I came up with the phrase. I was talking to these two moms and they were just like, shot it we don't believe you, right? Like we just, we've been burned by the system. You know, we're very hesitant. Um, and also thinking about the pandemic, we had told families for two years, do not come to school, right? So we had very strong messaging about not coming to the community. We wanted to be intentional about what would be the kind of story we wanted to tell, the new narrative of not just we want families here, but we love you here. Um, so that's where the slogan kind of came from. But then it was more than a slogan. It was really a commitment to see families, to value them, to, to honor their wisdom. And what we did is we reframed attendance through an engagement strategy. So we love you here was kind of our, the umbrella to which all of that kind of was under, was how do we strate strategically think about something that just felt just staggering. Like our numbers for chronic absenteeism skyrocketed after the pandemic as so many schools across the country. So to be able to say, no, family engagement isn't like the goal, some add-on. We're going to use this based on the evidence, which we know impacts academic outcomes. And we're going to say, this is the strategy that is going to allow us to decrease chronic absenteeism. And we love you here. That's what that represented, is making sure our families, our students knew that we wanted them here. But also, it wasn't just about how many days you missed it was an opportunity to learn the story behind. Why were you missing school? Um, so everything about attendance, we reframed it from having attendance officers to saying, wait, if engagement is about prioritizing relationships, an attendance officer is not what's going to get us there. Family liaisons who were rooted in the community, who became experts in those neighborhoods, what churches, where do people go on Saturday? You know, those were going to be the relationships and the bridges that were going to allow us to decrease chronic absenteeism. And that's what we did. The results were um, were were astounding. Um, and we not only decreased chronic absenteeism, but more importantly, we built trust. Mm -hmm. I really appreciate it. even just hearing attendance officer versus family liaison semantically. There's just something very viscerally different about the two. Thank you so much for that. Eyal, you've also done valuable research on the impact of this work. I'm really curious about the specific examples that you might be able to point us to that really demonstrate how important engagement with families um, really are to the schools. Sure. Well, um, again, thank you so much for inviting me and for uh, being a part of this esteemed panel. Um, so, you know, this, this, this research study that we've been a part of stems from the early days of the pandemic. I mean, many of us in the field were hearing that the schools, since all the schools got shuttered, that there were some schools out there that had better relationships with their students' families that we were starting to hear would might have a, a, a slightly better time withstanding the disruptions and the closures. Mm -hmm. And it so happens that Dr. Mapp mentioned this on a webinar with some funders that sparked their interest and we were able to secure some funding to create this study. And as a part of this study, so Learning Here is an organization I work with as well as TNTP, we've been engaged in this study using the five essentials data set in Illinois. And this is a really important data set because the vast majority of teachers across the state have been completing this survey for the last 10 years. It measures five foundational supports, one of which is the involved families metric. Um, and it is an outgrowth of the same research that Dr. Mapp started her framing with from Barbara Schneid and I'm um, sorry, uh, Tony Bright and Barbara Schneider at the University of Chicago. And so what we found by looking at schools from across the state is that we know that everybody's chronic absenteeism rate really shot up at, as a result of the pandemic. But the schools that had strong engagement scores pre-pandemic were far more likely to have lower 
chronic absenteeism rates than the schools that had poor engagement scores. In some cases, if you were in the 90th percentile of what's called the involved families metric, your chronic absenteeism chronic absenteeism rate was six percentage points lower than if you were in the 10th percentile. And that's controlling for all the community and school characteristics that are available out there. Attendance was 25% better. I mean, just to put it in real numbers, like if you're in a school of 500, that's 31 kids that are not chronically absent. If you're in a school of 1,000, that's 62 children. That's 62 babies that are not chronically absent. That is multiple classrooms. That's a whole great level, right? If you, and, and to put it in financial terms, if you live in a state like mine in California, where you get funded based on average daily attendance, right? In a school of 500 kids, that's $45,000 for that school. So we saw this impact also, just to be clear, across schools. We saw the impact in elementary schools, middle schools, high schools. In fact, the highest effect sizes were in middle schools, to our surprise. And honestly, like when we first saw the numbers, Dr. Mab can tell you, we were like, we asked our friends, our quant friends and at TNTP, it's like, is this for real? Like, And they were like, we had to run the numbers multiple times. We actually couldn't believe it. I think this just underscores um, people people often feel that family engagement is that nice to have, right? And so that we'll get to it when we have time. But what these numbers show, what Dr. Harris's experience in Richmond shows, and what this shows is that if you really invest in family engagement, you actually see real outcomes for, for kids and for schools. And in some ways, it feels a little bit counterintuitive. You know, when we think about students not wanting to come to school or not, for some reason not showing up, we think of, you know, often the curriculum, the people who are teaching, right, the stories that are told, all of that is so important. And we're also saying that family engagement seems to have a real impact on chronic absenteeism, which by general definition is a student missing about 10% of the school year, which is huge. Um, so, Eyal, I'm just wondering, you've looked specifically again at family engagement, chronic absenteeism, what more can you say about that? What did family engagement look like, for example? Well, I'll share that we're, we're really excited because we're rolling out the second stage of that study now, which is gonna be a qualitative look at schools across the state to really understand why did some schools overperform expectations? Why did some schools underperform expectations? But I think in, in many ways, there's a long, history of evidence in the field of family engagement. Dr. Mapp has really been a leader in the field for a long time on this. And I think many of your viewers know that. And so if we go back to what she shared at the very beginning, the indispensable role of building relationships. That, that to, In my experience, the, the number one reason why family engagement efforts fail is that they're not focused on building trusting relationships with families. Mm. They tend to be transactional. So it's like when you're a parent, you come to the school, you come to back to school night, you're expecting to see, uh, you know, that you're going to get talked at about your curriculum. You go to parent teacher conferences, you have 10 minutes with six teachers in a row and say, it's a, you, there's no like getting to know you like Dr. Harris was explaining. There's no like understanding who you are, the funds of knowledge, the wealth of wisdom that you bring to bear for your kids. That's not brought into the classroom. So it's actually not surprising that we're seeing in our surveys and others that like attendance at back to school nights are dropping. Folks are less likely to come to the school because why would you if it doesn't, if it's not going to actually advance student learning. But when we see that schools first step really build authentic relationships. And I think that really starts by listening. That starts by acknowledging that we actually have a lot of power in the relationship between homes and schools. And so how can we disrupt those traditional power imbalances, go into the community, seed the agenda to families, and then build that relationship so that you can have productive conversations about how kids are doing in schools. Like we, we find in our surveys of parents from across the country that 90% of parents in America think that their kids are at grade level, which is shocking because the truth is far below that. And so parents have a misguided understanding oftentimes of how their kids are doing in school because we're not actually anchoring. Parents don't often aren't told exactly like, you know, schools are doing all these formative assessments. They're like analyzing kids on cuts, but they're not sharing that information with families and not proactively 
building their family engagement strategies such that you're building relationships so that you can have really productive conversations about what the experience of kids is. Wonderful. Thank you so much. And, um, you know, with the rest of our time, I'd love to engage our audience. Let's see uh, some of the questions uh, posed by our audience for the panelists. The first one I see here, what advice do you have about engaging communities that have dealt with trauma, including violence? Um, Shade, I know you mentioned a little bit of acknowledging history um, and just recognizing that things have been very uh, not equal in this nation. I wonder if you might want to add to that. Absolutely. I think it's a really powerful question. And what's 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 great about when you really get to the definition of engagement, it applies for everyone, every population, whether you've experienced trauma, um, whether you've had a stronger um, or a more positive um, relationship with the system, a broken relationship. But when you think about you know, authentic engagement, one of the key pieces is you're you're not leading with your mouth, you're leading with your ears. So the most powerful thing, especially when harm um, has been done is listening with generosity. And that's just really hard to do because it means you have to be silent for a little bit. <laughs> you have to be still and to be able to just create spaces where you're just listening. Um, it can be really hard to do. And I think I all talked about like, because we wanna do things really fast, there's just no shortcut to building a relationship. Like you can't speed it up, that's the thing. And that's why it's so hard for people to do is because it actually takes time. So I think the first thing is investing the time and then changing the nature of those interactions so every moment becomes an opportunity to listen and learn. So that may be even just starting off a conference with what are your hopes and dreams for your child? Like that one question is something that very quickly shifts the dynamic. I'm saying you have wisdom, you have something to offer, you are an expert, um, and I care about what your vision is um, for your child. This is your joy. So I think something like just as simple as the questions we ask families, but being able to slow down. Because when your goal is to share information, you skip all of that, right? The goal is to share information. So even just thinking, how do I use every opportunity to prioritize relationships, um, that will be the key thing that will support you with any family, but especially families who've experienced a lot of tra trauma and harm. And Joe, can I jump in? I just yeah, I was to gonna say you're today. smiling, nodding. Mm -hmm. So one of the things that I found because I've worked with practitioners now, um, training them, working with them for for several decades, is that sometimes what's also under that question is fear. I've I've had uh, educators who will say to me, you know, they work in communities where there there's trauma, where there's been violence, and they they are themselves afraid. Mm. to work with families who've mm. had those circumstances. And sometimes the educators and practitioners also are carrying trauma. And and so, so this is one of the reasons why getting trained in this area, being good at engagement is a skill. I have to say, I'm sort of a bit of a proud parent here because these two folks on the screen here are my former students and, and they're, they're carrying the baton of this engagement work in a way that's just absolutely tremendous and I'm very proud. And I think they will also tell you that a lot of times our educators are more fearful of mm -hmm. going into the communities and talking to these families than the families are to talk to them. So, so this is something that we have to think about when, when we hear that question and we have to honor and validate that there's a vulnerability factor here, right? That has to be overcome or maybe not even overcome, just has to be acknowledged and addressed. Uh, and so I do think that this is why many districts now, which is great, are being smart and creating engagement positions at the cabinet level so that the staff, the teachers, the principals can get access to some good training so that they themselves can overcome the fear of trying to create these relationships with diverse populations of families. 
Yeah, there's something powerful about just naming that fear. Thank you for that. Um, Karen, we'll start with you on this one too, and then we'll move to others. How would you differentiate? There's a very practical question here. How would you differentiate between engagement for schools that are maybe elementary level versus middle school and then upper school families? Anything that you might do differently between those levels? Well, you absolutely have to because engagement, if it's a strategy, it has to shift to honor the developmental levels of the students. So the kinds of things that you do in the elementary level, like a lot of my families, you know, we laugh and joke together because they'll say, you know, when my child was in elementary school, they love to see me come to the school. They love to see me sit in on the classroom. And by the way, when we say parent, we mean all adult caretakers because this could be a grandparent talking or an auntie talking. But boy, oh boy, you show up at the high school and <laughs> they don't want you anywhere near them. They don't want you in the classroom. You know, stay out. Don't look at me, et cetera, et cetera. So the types of engagement strategies that we that we use change. And I'll tell you, the best people to help you put together engagement initiatives at the middle and high school levels are the families because the families will tell you, you know, these are the, some of the things that I'm concerned about. Is there a way that you can make a conversation about what's going on in literacy math and math a little bit more user-friendly so I know what to ask my child? Um, are there ways that you can help me with social media? Are there conversations that you can help me with um, when, I, when we talk about some of these, you know, terrific changes that happen to our kids? So there are these essential conditions that I think will run through every age and grade level, but the context and the conversations have to change. The actual ways that you may construct the engagement have to change, but you still mm -hmm. have to form relationships. You still need to make sure that what you're doing is linking to learning. You still have to honor the community knowledge. All those things are those basic but essential conditions that have to be integrated into all of our practice, K through 12 and beyond. Thank yeah. you. So, uh -huh, go ahead, Aya. I'll just add quickly. I think one of my messages to my middle school and high school friends is if you want to build a relation, you I understand you've got 100 students and that it feels undaunting to do a hundred home visits, let's say in the community or to like call a hundred parents, but, but really trying to build a relationship with 10 families does not do harm to the other 90 families. Like it is okay to reach out and build relationships mm -hmm. with students, families, regardless of who they are, because it will pay dividends in the long term. And, and I think, especially at the secondary level, our, our administrators have also not really been trained in effective family engagement strategies either. And we run a, a training institute for school principals. And a big part of what we try to do is to help school principals really try to build some systems because the, especially at the secondary level, it's not always in people's notions that this is what is supposed to be their job. So it needs to be built into the fabric of the school more intentionally. Amazing. So as a final prompt to all three of you, in one sentence, if you could highlight that one thing about family and school engagement, what would that be? Literally in 15 seconds each. Maybe you can start with you, Shade. For us, families. Mm. Be intentional about building relationships first. See your families as the experts that they are. Yes, that's amazing. Thank you so much. Thanks to the work of our guests, Karen Knapp, Shade Harris, and Eyal uh, Bergman. We're reminded that when families and schools engage in trusting partnerships, and when restorative approaches are utilized above punitive ones, and when it's intentional, when we trust families and really center their experiences, their histories, um, their languages, their cultures and heritage, and really center that um, as, again, the foundations for learning for our students, it's really the young people that benefit. And when young people benefit, their families, their schools, and the broader society all benefit. Thank you everyone for joining us and thank you to our speakers again, Karen Matt, Shade Harris, and A.L. Bergman. Thank you.